But uh, tonight we are on New Jerusalem glory, uh, and uh, we continue uh, to look at some of the things that uh, we've been looking at New Jerusalem glory, and uh, we have some charts for you. But before we look at some of the charts, let me get all everything ready. Uh, yes, I got to also configure this, and. Um, Yes, as we look at the scriptures, we just have uh, two things that we want to introduce so that you know the subject matter in which we are going into. Firstly, let me ask a question here. What's the difference between the presence of God and the glory of God? The presence of God and the glory of God. Uh, think carefully about the presence of God and the glory of God. What is the difference? Uh, and uh, and uh, if you've got some answers, just raise your hands and volunteer some of your answers. Praise the Lord. Is there a difference? And if there is, what is the difference? Or perhaps there's no difference. Are they synonyms or are they different? The presence of God and the glory of God. It's all in your Bible. So, all right. Any volunteers? It's even in the presence is manifested. It's called the glory. The glory of God is the manifest presence. Glory of God is a manifest presence. So the presence of God is always invisible. If it's just presence, can be God's presence everywhere, but it doesn't mean it's manifested. Okay. So God's presence everywhere. The glory of God is a manifest presence of God. Okay. It's from Pastor Eddie. Any others? Differentiating. Making them the same. The difference between the presence of God and the glory of God. You're raising your hand there? No. Okay. <laughs> you got your answer, right? No. Okay. Right. Anyone on this side? And we is just about to answer. <laughs> okay. Any things coming from you? Something to think about. Brother Yad still thinking, presence of God and the glory of God. Hey, your attention for very long. No one has asked you that question. Right, it's a good question to ask during all night prayer. And also, there's a signs and wonders manifested. So the, the, the glory of God manifested. Signs and wonders manifested the glory of God. So every time a miracle happens, there's a glory of God taking place. Okay. And the presence of God. Presence of God and the glory of God. Anyone on this side? Hello. Praise the Lord. And, uh, let's see anyone from the back there. The difference between the present, we just started, we just started, and just asking everyone, what is the difference between the presence of God and the glory of God? And they're thinking, 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 thinking. Right. Uh, what's the difference between the presence of God and the glory of God? Right. We have all the way from Abigail at the back. Yes. Presence of God is something external. The glory of God is something that can be imparted. The glory of God is internalized. Presence of God is external. The so glory of God is inside. Presence of God is outside. Uh, what about the Old Testament? Could the glory of God fill the whole tabernacle? Exodus chapter 14. Second Chronicles chapter 5. 
And then the glory of God came again in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 after most, uh, Solomon prayed. Interesting, eh? Uh, the one that you, the, your answer uh, would have come from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul talked about the weight of his glory inside us. And remember Romans chapter 8, they talk about how the glory is working in us until we become the sons of God. So yes, there's a point of the glory in us, but Old Testament there's a glory outside of us. Now that Smart Alex is here, I'm looking for you this night. And we are asking the question before we start the sermon, what is the difference between the presence of God and the glory of God? Or is there a difference? Or are they synonyms? Come together. Come together, la. Okay. <laughs> That's the answer. Okay. They come together. Okay. Let me help you in the answer. Is the glory from the presence or is the presence from the glory? Now, bear in mind, let me throw all the verses out. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord. And the four living creatures say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then they continue to proclaim that he saw the glory of God. So there's the glory that is there. There's the glory of the Father, glory of the Son. And Jesus coming is the glory of the Lord. Now, there's the glory of God, there's the presence of God. Are both the different aspects of the same thing? Choice number A. Let me give you objective answer. It's a subjective answer. You all like objective answer, right? So you can tick and pick up ABC. Now, A. The glory of God and the presence of God are different aspects of the same substance. They are like synonyms. Just like we consider love, light, and uh, love, light, and uh, love, light, and light. Yes, the three L's. So that's answer A. Answer B. The presence of God flows from the glory of God. Answer C. The glory of God flows from the presence of God. I repeat again. Answer A is like that. They're both the same. Let's say the right hand is the, is the glory of God and the left hand is the presence of God. They're both the same. Then answer B, the presence of God flows from the glory of God. So it's beneath. It's a subset. Answer C, the glory of God flows from the presence of God. So you've got three choices. Now I force you all to answer. A, B, or C. Some of you are thinking, is there a D? Yes. <laughs> D means I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, which is not in your normal objective answer. Alright. How many of you just guess. It doesn't matter if you're wrong. Because at the end of tonight, you will have that clarified. How many of you answer A? One, two, three. Hey, higher, more confident. One, two, three, four, five, five. Five answers, none at the back. Five, okay. How many of you answer B? See, or some B. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, okay. Okay, about five, six. How many you answer C? What oh, a lot of C, eh? Remember what was C? The glory of God came from the presence of God. Okay. C is a majority. Alright, thank you. Uh, how many answer D? <laughs> Alright. So, we will answer that question afterwards. 
<laughs> because I got another question. So that you know that at the end of tonight, you have two of these questions answered. The other question, which is related to what we're going to teach tonight, is um, I have to read some scriptures before they ask that question. Taken from Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And it talk about um, verse 8. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. So Jesus is seated and he waits for all things to be put under his feet. That is what the Bible said. As far as God is concerned, it's all done. But he's waiting for all things to put under his feet. Now we look at he, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, chapter 15 is uh, a chapter that talks about the uh, resurrection of Jesus. So here it comes. And same thing it says, when Christ rose from the dead, it says for in verse 22, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign Till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed. So he even tell you who is the last enemy. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he, he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Here comes a question. When are all things put under his feet? And you've got several choices. I give objective answer. Right. A. When Jesus Christ comes and lands on the Mount of Olives. Zechariah chapter 14. His coming, the second coming at the end of the tribulation. Then he lands. So all things are under his feet. That's A. B. When when the judgment throne is open and he sits on the judgment seat in the book of Revelation chapter 20, right at the end of the millennium. So it's time scale. Time scale is at the end of the tribulation, A, B, at the judgment, C, the white throne judgment, and that's at the end of the millennium. C, When the church becomes raptured, all things are complete. Think very carefully. These are all timelines. 
and he's talking about things subject under his feet. I thought when he was resurrected, because Ephesians 1. Oh, you got D. Okay, yes. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Chapter 1, yes. He said that he put all things under his feet, and he to be the head over all things to the church. That was yes. when he was raised from the dead. Yes. So you put it when he was raised from the dead. Okay. I won't leave that, leave that as D, but that is a clue to the right answer. You found a clue to the right answer. Wow, Eddie got a, Pastor Eddie really got a clue. That clue will tell you whether the right answer is A, B, or C. Interesting questions tonight. May you think. Right? Because tonight you got all night to do thinking. <laughs> you can pray in the spirit and then think. So, after thinking carefully, do you want to volunteer your answer before everybody? What's A again? <laughs> a is when Jesus comes and lands on the Mount of Olives. Second coming at the end of the tribulation. B is white throne judgment in Revelation 20. C is when the church is raptured and then the church age ends. Only one is the correct answer. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I want to mix things up. <laughs> I mix things up. Yeah. Otherwise, C should be A, right? Push everything that line up. Yeah. Good. Good point. Says our teacher. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. Any questions before I start counting A, B, C? Okay, you all think carefully already? Okay, now, how many of y'all believe that A is the correct answer? Wait, go ahead. B is the correct answer. Okay, white throne judgment. Okay, thank you. C is the correct answer. Okay, so most of you are on B, white throne judgment. Right? Based on what Eddie brought forward, the correct answer is C. Okay, let's look at that's what Eddie already, Pastor Eddie gave you the answer. That's why I didn't put it as D. <laughs> See? Now read carefully Ephesians chapter 1. He says here in Ephesians chapter 1. That, uh, okay, I just don't like this scrolling, but verse 22. Okay. Ah, here it is. Verse 20 to 20. We need to start from verse 20. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, might and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Can you see that? That which is to come. You know how sometimes when, um, when you're in a valley where there's an echo, and you say, Hello, 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 hello. the echo goes away, it goes below 20 decibel, uh, not 20, uh, 20 vibrations per second, and you cannot hear it anymore, although some people can hear below that. Uh, so it depends on how much echo there is. Now when you say, hello, it might echo, let's say, if it's a really good place that echoes, it might echo for a few minutes. A few minutes. But you actually already stop. Speak it. But it's still echoing. Consider that. Consider this point. Why C is the correct answer? 
is because point number one the highest and most supreme revelation of God from Genesis all the way to Revelation is New Jerusalem don't you think so? New Jerusalem caps everything that God was working towards it's New Jerusalem it was like his ultimate revelation and glory and that's in the future it's even in chapter 21 and 22 chapter 21 into new heaven and new earth new jerusalem is right in our future the age to come it is the highest revelation of god when new jerusalem came down and the angel was so excited he says let come i will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife, New Jerusalem. That's point number one. Who is New Jerusalem? Where is New Jerusalem? When is New Jerusalem instituted? Throughout the whole Bible period. God has been calling people from the time of Old Testament right through the New Testament age. He has been calling people throughout human history to be a part of New Jerusalem. It looks like time is just a geography to God and God picked the best people from every age who love Him. From every age, from the time that mankind started, right to the end times today God picked them and then put them all together in one time dimension which is New Jerusalem and they form New Jerusalem we are the cream of the cream the best of the best not because of our own works but because of what Christ has worked in us He picked us up like flowers and He put us together and formed us into New Jerusalem a bouquet of flowers he picked flowers from all of mankind's history. So New Jerusalem, the work for New Jerusalem, started in the Bible. And when was it complete? It was completed in the church age. In this age. We are called the bride. Ephesians chapter 5 says we are the bride. We are married to Christ. We are the bride. That is point two. The selection of the bride begins and it begins from the time of mankind but identify. The bride grows up ready to marry Jesus. Mankind is ready to marry Jesus. In the New Testament, we are grown up. They started as children under the law, remember. We are under grace, we grow up above the law. We become sons. It's all covered in human history as one epoch with, that God is bringing the bride, the story of the bride. That is completed. And the glorious church is in this side of the rapture. The seven years was originally behind us. It was originally part of the 70 years of Jeremiah. Then it became 70 times 7, remember? Then it became 69 weeks plus one week. So that, that one extra week was taken and put in, in the future of the church. And you know why? You see, God is, God is doing quantum time. The reason is because in that section is the most evil. 
And God cannot allow that in the church age. So God isolated the seven years, which actually belong to the Old Testament. It's part of the 69 weeks. But it's in our future because that's when the Antichrist is in fullness. So you cannot put it before the Antichrist was born. He has to put it when the Antichrist is the most mature. When he allow him to mature in evil. And he does not allow Antichrist to fully demonstrate his evil during the church age. So the only place he could put it was after the rapture. So the seven years that is there, that is why he called the Old Testament prophets to come. The best of the Old Testament prophets come and do the first three and a half years. And it is supposed to be a completion of the last seven weeks of Daniel. Although it's in our future, it belongs to the past. Oh, what a concept. And then remember, there's a time in the millenn- in, after the millennium when there was a rebellion, the battle of Gog and Magog and Armageddon that take place after the millennium in Revelations. That was chopped off and taken and thrown back into the seven years. So the seven years is a quantum time. It's a quantum time where all the evil is thrown into that sector. And it's a quantum time where everything after the millennium is thrown backwards. So it's thrown forward, it's thrown backwards. The seven years is out of face with time. Can you see that? It's out of face with time. It's like an echo of time. Treat the seven years as an echo in time. The actual completion is a rapture. Wow, took so long to put point two. And my speeching haven't started yet. <laughs> this one is answering your question. What to next gonna be oh, oh, like get your coffee ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, so uh, I think that's a good idea. Maybe we should let you drink some coffee and <laughs> anyway. So uh, uh, you can have your drinks by the way, you know. And you can you can put the thermos plus next time you count and have your coffee, whatever it is. And uh, so all that I don't recommend so much coffee in your fasting. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, you can bring your coke, maybe. You know? <laughs> 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 whatever. Coke has caffeine, if I remember. And so point two, to support the point that Pastor Eddie point to, why the church age is what Jesus was waiting for. So that's point two to support the, uh, that point. And then, third point is right inside the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. Verse 22, He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church. To the church. Now, the church is His bride and at the same time His body. And until Satan and all authority is under the feet of the church, it is not complete. He is not interested to put all authority and rule just directly under him. That is of course under him. He wants to put it under his bride. So that we all remember Joshua did something when he, when he got, the, got the five kings out of the cave where they were hiding and he threw them to the ground and then he put his foot on their necks and then he got all his leaders to put their foot on the neck and that was an instruction that the Holy Spirit made him do as a prophetic act because that points to our time today when we will literally crush Satan under our feet during this dispensation. We'll exercise all rule and authority. That is from Ephesians chapter 1 to prove it. Then you have Daniel chapter 2. In the days of the Tentos, the kingdom of God is established. And that kingdom is this end times. 
We are the people who live in the time of the Ten Toes. Not John Wesley's time. Because in, 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 in John Wesley's time, Russia hasn't formed yet. Great Russia hasn't come out. I mean, it existed long ago. But not in the form that we have today. The kind of God and man God that it exists. I know England was there, France was a long time, and Russia, I know, I know Russia exists as a nation, you know, but it hasn't turned communist after 1917. It began to get rid of God. I, so the, the ten toes were being formed properly from long ago. And way back then, it was not time to establish the kingdom. But in this end time, in the days of the ten toes, and when the ten toes are about to have three of them fall by the little horn, this is in our time. And that's when the rock in Daniel chapter 2 hit the ten toes, and the kingdom was, the, the, the rock not cut by the hands of man grew, and it became the most powerful force. Look at Daniel chapter 2 and you realize you realize that it has to do with all rule and all authority and power just like any empire except this is a spiritual empire that dominates the natural a spiritual empire that dominates the natural so let's look at Nebuchadnezzar's dream as interpreted by Daniel in Daniel chapter 2 Tells us, uh, okay, just don't like this scrolling. Okay, uh, let's go to the ten toes. Oh, we're coming to the toes. And in the days, it was 44, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. That is the rule and reign of Christ. Remember 1 Corinthians 15. And he shall reign. He shall reign. Until everything is put under his feet. And guess what? He reigns through us. So all these four points are to support why the correct answer is C. Now, these two questions are related tonight. The answer to the presence and the glory of God. Defining the presence and glory of God and His relationship. Because all glory proceeds from New Jerusalem glory. All the glory are all aspects of New Jerusalem glory. And the reason why all rule and authority is under the church is because of the glory of God. Remember the manifest sons of glory begin to have dominion over the elements of the earth. Once you've got dominion over the elements of the earth, Satan is powerless against you. There's no rule, no, no authority that can come against you. How? When the law of physics doesn't apply to you anymore. And Satan is limited to the natural world. Because he's a fallen being. Which is why all the temptation of the enemy is through the natural but when you're above the natural, it's a different dimension. All these truths are connected. So now that we have put all these things together, uh, we want to show, first of all, uh, let's show the, the cube, the cube, the three cubes. We show the three cubes. And uh, now, this cube, uh, we name it from our side. The first cube, 
with the a. Second cube is the universe. Third cube is uh, the Trinity. And, uh, and each one is inside the other. See this pink one is inside this one, and pink and orange is inside this one. And it's just a revelation of God. This is the final place which we are reaching. This is what God is building. Now, in the final cube, we have actually the Holy Spirit, Christ, and then the uh, top panel, you can't see here, it's called God the Father. And uh, then this is uh, the new earth and uh, new heaven. Uh, uh, you just can't see it from the top, but that's all right. And uh, so basically what you see is the Trinity. All you have is the Trinity. God, the Holy Spirit, God, the Son, new heaven, new earth. Above is God the Father, below is this universe. See, below is this universe that contains all the other cubes. Uh, below is the old universe, this old universe, and, and below this, uh, this universe further is this earth, the center of what God is doing. So what I'm pointing to is everything becomes simplified as it's complete, and we actually just relate to the Trinity. New heaven, new earth relate to the Trinity. That's it. The old universe is preserved because of... Uh, some of those who do not qualify to enter New Jerusalem. But they're part of the human race. And so it's just preserved because of God's mercy. And uh, they will never, they will live their entire existence eternally without being able to enter into New Heaven, New World. They will forever remain the bottom panel. But it is at least a panel. And they exist as one dot in those panels. Are uh, the mercy of God. It is that. But they cannot enter new heaven and new, new earth. Uh, neither, uh, they are not part of New Jerusalem at all. They are not part of New Jerusalem at all. Then the other, uh, now we go to the other chart, the 12 glories, the chart made by Brother Yap. Thank you. Okay, we can make this bigger. Uh, stand on this side so you can see. Right. Now, I mentioned that the 12 tribes, each one represents one of the glories. The 12 glories are divided into four types of glory. Basically, they are the glory of the Trinity. We always know the Trinity, which is God the Father, and uh, then you are actually God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So it's the glory of the Son, the glory of the Father, the glory of the Holy Spirit. And they express in a more detailed way. The angels express the glory of the Spirit a lot. And uh, here, Jesus, Lamb of God, and the Lion, Trap of Judah, that's the glory of Jesus. And then here is the glory of the Father. They are expressed in this way. This fourth section is a special thing. Mankind, although we are created beings, we join with the Trinity. That is what God is bringing us to. Now you see why the end times is very important. What God is doing. Look at the bigger picture. God is not just God is not just working in this revival on the earth. God is planning things for new Jerusalem, new heaven, and new earth. That is what God is doing. So every decision you make, that you might think that it's a decision, like the planting a church here, planting a church there, it's just on the planet earth, there is a lot of things going on that involve us being prepared for New Jerusalem. And destinies can be lost. Destinies can be lost. And uh, i talk about that later when the Father says it's time 
but there are some revelations and downloads that we are having of things happening in the spirit, things changing, and uh, it's a very serious thing that God is doing. But when the time comes, I'll talk about that. In the meantime, let's consider the 12 types of glory. Uh, mind you, we are where we are in the perfect will of God. Everything that has happened thus far has been a test in every way that God has designed. And to this test, people are better prepared for 2027 to 2034. So that you know how the enemy can use different things to make a wrong look right and a right looks wrong. And fulfill the Bible scriptures where it says they will even ostracize you and cast your name out as evil. Luke chapter 6. Uh, What God is doing is actually revealing His glory. Now, here is this part. To understand this part, you need to understand the fullness of John chapter 17. Remember what John 17 is. And we leave that picture there, and I'll read to you from John 17. Uh, or maybe we should just show them John 17 too. And you got a picture there. And John chapter 17. You might not realize the fullness of what Jesus was trying to do. But he says here, uh, in verse 4, he says he finished his work. And then he says in verse 5. Verse 5 here. I read together with you. And he says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now you know why tonight we had to study the word glory and the word presence. Because if you understand the difference and the relationship, it helps you to progress into the new Jerusalem glory, through all the various short glories that are there. That's why uh, the points, the answer to the question one, are keys to help you to grow in new Jerusalem glory. The answer to question two is to give you the overall picture to realize that Jesus is actually waiting for us. Technically, isn't that right? If the church becoming glorified equals to all things put under His feet, logically, it means He's waiting for the church. When the church become glorified, then all things are now under His feet. Hallelujah. And that seals everything. Then ignore the seven years, we move straight into the millennium. The seven years are like time out of face. Where all the evil is thrown there to be dealt with. Uh, so He says, with the glory which I had with you before the world war. So He's talking about his glory that he had before he emptied himself of that glory. Then, uh, let's read on. And uh, read only particular verses. Uh, he prays for us. He has given us the word. And, uh, okay, right towards the ending part. And, uh, so I like this part that I just like to read. They are not of the world. So always remember that. We might live in this world. We might have families in this world. We might have relationships in the world. We might have employee-employer relationship in the world. We might have friendships with different people in the world. We might enjoy some of the food and the, the cultures and the things of this world that we, we have grown up in physically. But remember, these are all temporary. They should not affect your eternal decision. Uh, we are not of this world. It says. So never become worldly. They are not of this world just as I am not of the world. 
and his sacrifice. And here's a part. I do not pray for these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Can you see? Look at the title, oneness. I call it, for lack of a better term, Trinity oneness. It's not the oneness that we all might share. You know, long ago when I was at the Baptist church, there's always a song that we sing. And the song that we sing, you know, sometimes we would like, uh, forgot, uh, we join our hands this way. And then we sang, sing that song. Blessed be the tie that binds. You know, those of you from Baptist background. Our hearts in Christian love. You know, it's a song the Baptists always sing. And uh, they, we, we cultivate certain oneness or whatever uh, that is there. Listen, that is on this earth. He is talking about a trinity oneness. They may also be one in us. See, I, he says, as you, Father, are in me. Isn't the Father in Jesus in trinity oneness? And then, I in you. See? Jesus in the Father. This Trinity oneness. Then He adds us to the Trinity oneness. We, we, are, we are never exactly like God because God is uncreated. But yet, He privileged the bride, New Jerusalem, to be added. Now remember, New Jerusalem begins in this age. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about it. We have come to Mount Zion. Paul was talking about it from that time when he wrote the Bible. And remember uh, Revelation chapter 3. He writes the name of New Jerusalem to those who overcome in the church age on our forehead. Which means it's released during this revival. New Jerusalem glory. That's why as we are taking time to spend time to teach about New Jerusalem glory in this all night prayer. And why all night? Why I choose all night? So that after the teaching, you can pray into it. With the teaching fresh in you, then the rest of the many hours, you can spend praying into it. So he's talking about Trinity oneness. Now, in case we, for, we, we ignore that or we miss it, it repeats again. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Hey, we cannot miss it. Trinity oneness. He's talking about oneness of God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. He adds us to that oneness. He never does that with the angels. Whenever the angels you know, go and travel and go with me to different places and all those things, and, uh, there's a place in God that you, they will walk with you and they always escort you on this earth. They're always around when we are. They'll escort, escort. And then there's a place that you walk and walk and walk and then uh, when you go near to the throne of God, there's a place where the angels stop. They don't, they don't go past. But you and I, as redeemed saints of God by the blood of the Lamb continue walking all the way into God because the angels don't, don't, don't go into that dimension it belongs to the sons of God um, so we have here and the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one just as one. Then look at the next words. I in them, you in me. Hey, that's Jesus in us, the Father in Him. That they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me. 
so that we completely reflect Jesus. This is Trinity oneness. Then in case we miss it, verse 24, we go, I move it up. Look at what he says here. Verse 24. Father, I desire. You know why all this, you know, comes to revelation? I've been praying John 17 since 1979. I've been meditating on John 17 for decades. I, I've been praying through it for the church. Because I thought, okay, you know, Jesus prayed it, we must pray it. Because that is Jesus' desire. So, with whatever little knowledge I had in those days, 1979, I said, okay, I think, because in, I love Jesus very much, and I said, what does Jesus want? See, I didn't ask what I want in 1979. I asked, what does Jesus want? And I said, and I tried to discover what Jesus wants. And then I realized, the last prayer of John 17 is what Jesus wanted. So I said, if this is what Jesus you want, then I will want what you want. And I'll pray constantly, John 17, which is what I did from 1979. It's recorded in my meditation file. So, this is what Jesus wants. And he says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me. Remember earlier, the first few verses, he says, Bring me back to the glory I had with you before the world began. Now he's bringing us back all the way to where he sits in the Trinity. Seated in how many places with him. And he says, Where I am, they may behold my glory. Which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. He's talking about way back when he first came into this created universe. And uh, the word behold, uh, Teorio, uh, let's see, behold, conceive, look on, okay, that's fine. Now, with that in mind, can we show the twelve glories again? Charge with brother, yeah, it's made, oops, it got small, okay, that's fine. Now, now you know when I put it, we are put here, we are put here. New Jerusalem glory is interacting with the Trinity. Wow. That's a position he put us. The glory of the Spirit, the glory of the Son, the glory of the Father. And now the glory of New Jerusalem, the Bride of Christ. That's what God wants. For us to grow in the glory of New Jerusalem. Hey, I like the colors you choose. Oh, yeah, very nice. Right. I think your chart is better than my chart. <laughs> Must have taken some time. See, I can still see my old chart, the stars and all those things there. And then you superimpose on that. That's quite good. And uh, each of these represent, see, there are three aspects of the glory of New Jerusalem. Three aspects of the glory of uh, Jesus. Three aspects of the glory of the Father. Three aspects of the glory of the Holy Spirit. Which I mentioned, you know, authority. Uh, and then uh, power external, power internal. All three different aspects of how the glory of God works in our life. And when you look at all the twelve glories, you find that they have been manifest here and there, here and there in the whole Bible. Pockets of it. Little bits of it. But not in the same way. Do you know that there is tongues in the Old Testament? When God wrote in tongues. Mene, mene, take care of you for sin. And they look, what's that? The Babylonian king said, what's that? And... Then they asked for Daniel. Because nobody understood. Remember, in those days, they also got their scribes, scholars to study many languages. And whatever ancient language they had, they don't know what that was. And then somebody remembered, hey, 
in, in your in your father's time, you know, uh, there was a wise man, and his name is Daniel. He's retired now. Let's go and find him. And so they found Daniel. And Daniel looked at it. Daniel had an interpretation of tongues. He knew what he was. But there's a difference. No one spoke in tongues. So what was different in the New Testament? We spoke in tongues. If you were to analyze just now when we were praying over the country of Cambodia and Kenya, when I was praying for the Kenya, my tongues changed to an African tongue. It's a new different language. It is an ability that God gave us in the New Testament. Where we could speak various languages of various tongues. And once they become fluent in different things, when you pray for different things, sometimes God begins to use vocabulary from that area uh, to describe those things and languages from that area to pray more precisely. It's just like some of you, uh, because some of you could be from a Hokkien background and all those things, and uh, then when you hear Hokkien songs, you know, the, the, the mother tongue of your mother, and you say, wow, so touching, you know. Because it, it, it ministers to your subconscious at a very deep level. But a, you know, an English speaker who grew up speaking English as their first language from a child, and maybe plus maybe a German language, they hear Hokkien, mm, very funny sound. See, it's because subconsciously you have heard that sound. And remember, when you don't know the meaning and you heard those sounds when you were young, it already is thought in your brain somewhere and your emotion. That's why you feel something very deep vibrate within you, a resonance on your inside from something you heard from childhood. Uh, and, uh, so it, it's just like I mentioned about free choice and, and all those things. Like uh, we're all affected by our culture in our favorite foods. Today I still like tissue food because background. The taste buds have been spoiled, kind of thing. Of course, when God starts changing, as our taste buds will change. You know, as this physical body gets renewed and uh, become the new glorious body, our oh, taste buds all change. You all don't look very happy about it. Because <laughs> it might change so much, then one day you take your durian. <laughs> okay. So, before your body change, eat all the durians you want. <laughs> it was. So, all the, uh, so we're going to see the position here. Uh, then we understand now why the answer to the second question that why mankind is important and when mankind reaches its fullness, it will be as if all things have been put under the feet of Jesus. And it's complete. He reigns, He rules. Now, having looked at this and knowing this is a place we have to come in, let's consider the first question, which is the difference between, or the relationship between glory and the presence of God. Your answer is easy if you look at the original words. Now we can switch to the Bible. Thank you. And uh, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the word glory is the word kavod, which means like a weight or a substance. It's an Old Testament Hebrew word for glory. In the New Testament, the word glory is doxa. Doxa. And, and it, it just... Uh, it, does, it doesn't carry as much as a Hebrew. But Paul did describe in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 the weight of his glory. He also used the word the weight of his glory inside 2 Corinthians 4. However, the word presence in the Hebrew there are few words but there's only one main word. The word presence actually comes from the Hebrew word, panim, panim, P-A-N-Y-M, panim, sometimes they put an I inside, panim. 
Panim actually means the face of God. The face of God. But, see, when we talk about the presence of God, we did not imagine it to be the face. We only imagine some sort of atmosphere that is carried by His being. And that's where our English language is like us in understanding the presence of God. Although there's one time in the book of Genesis chapter 1 before uh, when, where Adam and Eve first was uh, way new in the Garden of Eden and they first fell, it says they heard the presence of God in the Garden. That's a different word, presence. That actually is a, uh, the word voice. Not panim, which is a normal word for present. In the Greek, in the New Testament, the word, the main word presence is from the word prosopon. And uh, prosopon means right before his face. Again, with the word meaning in his sight or face. But the word is more like eyes. The frontal part of the face. And, uh, so let's look at some of these words and then we s explain presence and glory. <clears throat> Say in uh, chapter 3, verse 8, you have here in chapter 3, verse 8. Say so here, this is the one I say, this word presence is not the normal word for presence. When they hid themselves from the presence of the, of the Lord, this word presence is actually the voice of the Lord. Now that's important. It's still important. These sight words, we look at the sight words for presence words. The sight words for presence here is, can you see panim? P-A-N-I-Y-M. Panim. That is there. Uh, from the presence but then you see here, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking. Can you see the word sound? Which is cold, from the word cold. These are the two words. Can you see the word sound and then the panin? That is that. So the presence that they had at that time was not fully the face of God. That's why I say it's a different person. It's the sound. Just the sound. And it's actually the call, which is the word for voice. Just hearing his voice or sound. They hear. Apparently, there are different levels of God's presence. When he says that, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them. Jesus says, Matthew 18. But, what type of presence, what level of presence, we need to understand. Not the full presence per se. We use the word per se means what it should be. But they are side round presence. But still powerful. So let me talk about the graduation in the God's presence. The very initial part of God's presence is actually just hearing His voice. My sheep hear my voice. John chapter 10, verse 27. You ask many Christians whether they can hear Jesus' voice. I don't think they can recognize Jesus' voice. So if you cannot hear Jesus' voice, you're not a sheep. You're a lamb. Lamb learn from sheep. Uh, that means you, you, you have to rely on others who can hear. Need guidance and training. Just like, you know, baby sheep or lambs, they have to also slowly learn from the older sheep to follow the shepherd's voice in a real life situation. And sheep are not easy to take care. Uh, I met some herdsmen in Canberra and he takes care of cattle and animals. So they got a lot of sheep. So one day, and now he came and he visits me in the house occasionally. He is one of those attends on the uh, home groups that we have. 
And so one day he says, you know, uh, I asked him about sheep and all that, since he's actually taking care of sheep. I asked him, and he says, sheep, when you have to take care? Goat's easy, let him run. Sheep, what? You know, need, need to take care of them. They are so delicate animals. Then one day he says, they got rid of all the sheep. They say, why? Too hard. I say, what do they have that cattle? The cattle, or just, just let them, I don't know, roam all about. And they're more rough and tough. Uh, and, uh, so, my sheep hear my voice. But do people actually hear Jesus' voice? Can they hear when he speaks? Can they recognize his voice? Or, if you cannot hear Jesus' voice, can you recognize Jesus' voice speaking to others when they have a download or revelation? That's also important. Because we need to follow the right sheep. So, if another sheep claims to hear the voice of Jesus, by all means, check first. Check the Bible, check everything. After you do all, you check, 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 check. And your Singaporean double, triple confirmation. Then, settle it. That's true. Flow along with that. And then one day, you will mature and be able to hear the same voice. Because when you come under people who hear the voice, Sooner or later, you will start hearing the same voice. That's how training happens. Now, the voice of sound is important because Elijah was an expert at hearing God's voice or the word from the Lord. And uh, in his time in 1 Kings chapter 19. Let's jump to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19. When he went into the cave, and uh, it was night, he went to a cave and spent the night in the place. Behold the word of the Lord. Came. And he said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He heard. He had a conversation with God. In visions, when uh, Elijah was hearing the voice uh, or the word of the Lord, it was it was almost like Smith Bigger's word. It's almost like you don't see anything there. But you can see that he could. He reacted to something he heard, like, like a spoken word. But no one can hear it but him. So it's very sensitive to hearing God's voice. In the Old Testament, the voice of God, not the word of God. And so when he said that, uh, the Lord said, in verse 11, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Then look at all the side effects of God's presence says, Behold, the Lord passed by, a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. It is a side effect. After the wind and earthquake, remember how earthquake is powerful. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Even the earthquake was a side effect. After the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. Neither the wind, nor the earthquake, nor the fire. And those three things already a lot of people are following. You know, people say, hey, brush your mighty wind. Oh, oh. You know, but the wind is a side effect. When you follow the side effect, you get side track. Don't follow side effects. Follow the voice. Voice of God. And after the fire, a still small voice. Can you see the word voice is the same Greek, same Hebrew word kol? Q O L Ko. Same as the one in Genesis 1, uh, Genesis 3, actually. 
where it says they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden, which is actually the voice of God in the garden. So the sound of the voice. And so he heard that still small sound. And since it's the Hebrew word call, Hebrew word call, then uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> Since it's the Hebrew word call, you can assume it's the same spiritual sound. It's the same spiritual sound. Call. Except that when Adam and Eve, when they fell, they ran away. Now, Elijah is going towards it. Can you see? He is a, he is a man redeemed. Looking forward to Jesus redeemed. He runs towards he never ran towards the wind, the earthquake, or the fire. He ran towards the voice. That is sound. That is part of your burning bush. The presence that you can hear the Lord. Now, there is a mistranslation in some parts in the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers, and uh, the one that we look at should be around chapter 12. Yes, Numbers chapter 12. And I like to put for in the part. I hope the translation came out good here. When uh, God was rebuking um, Miriam and Aaron for speaking against Moses, and in the rebuke, God says in verse. Uh, 6. Hear now my words. Because Aaron was claiming, claiming to be a prophet too. And he says, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I the Lord make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so my servant Moses. In other words, Moses had graduated to friendship with God. He's not just a prophet. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him, and here's the translation, face to face. And actually, in the Hebrew, it is not face to face. It's a mistranslation. This is numbers. So I haven't translated numbers yet. I'm still on the uh, Exodus. So I was wanting my own translation. So I would not put it face to face. I would put it, I speak with him mouth to mouth. It's from the Hebrew word pay, which is uh, like the mouth blowing, like the wind. In other words, spiritually, I'm, I'm speaking through his mouth. My voice comes through him. Like David prophesied. In his song, David says that the Lord speaketh through my lips. As he said. And a lot of prophecies were very accurate from his song compositions. So it's like the breath of God. So what God was saying was that I speak with him mouth to mouth. And of course, they don't dare to translate it because it has no meaning. But I would. I would just put it there uh, to, for understanding, uh, to be more accurate. And so it's not talking about face yet. It's talking about mouth. So I'm talking about even before you come into the actual presence of God, it is actually His voice that you hear. And when you learn to hear His voice, you're on your way into God's presence and the effect of His presence. But the word presence is actually the word panim. As you saw in uh, Genesis 3 verse 8, they ran from the face of the Lord, the panim, the face of the Lord. Now let me point to some places, uh, different places, it's all over. Uh, when Cain went up from the presence of the Lord, chapter 4 verse 16, it is the panim of the Lord. In other words, he left the face of the Lord. And uh, the word presence is in line with the word face, let me... Um, 
point to the angels in the book of Exodus and uh, Exodus chapter 33 verse 14 would be good you don't have to turn to everyone you can find it yourself but in verse 14 it says my presence will go with you see that's obviously the presence of God and, uh, and I will give you rest the word presence is the word panim. See the word P A N I Y M, panim. It actually means face. And uh, then he says in verse 15. Oops. I think it's a setting inside this one. Okay. Then he say to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Again, he uses the word panim, the presence of the Lord. But interesting, after that, he says in verse 18, please show me your glory. So there's a relationship between glory and the presence of God. But they're actually two different things. <coughs> two different things. But already you're getting the rough estimation. If presence means the face of God, then glory becomes a subset. Glory is a subset. Which means answer, was it answer B, right? Where glory, uh, 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 where, no, it was C, where Glory was under the present. So the correct answer is answer C. Glory is a subset from the face of God. How, how close can you get to God to actually touch His face? It's obvious that face of God is more personal than the glory of God. So the true word for presence is actually the face of God which gives us an understanding why when uh, now we look over why when uh, the blessings that God gave in, in uh, the book of Numbers the pronunciation of the blessings in chapter 6 verse 25 it says and this is a blessing that he taught the priest to bless him, bless the people of Israel. When he says, they are to say, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine on you. Now, why do they translate Panim as face here, when Panim is translated as presence everywhere? Isn't that inconsistent translation of the word Panim? Because the normal word for Panim is face. But now, when, when, it, when it suits them, they change the word Panim into presence, and then we all have the impression it's just an atmosphere. Instead of seeing that it's actually the face of God we're talking about. So tonight we're talking about the face of God, the presence of God, and uh, understanding New Jerusalem glory from the different glories. And the word Panim is here, which means that he actually says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His presence shine upon you. And be gracious to you. The Lord live up His countenance. That is an aspect of His face again. And uh, countenance is also panic. Don't know why the English should change the words. In the same blessing. If they are consistent, they will say, the Lord may His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up, lift up His face upon you. Because it's the same Hebrew word. Within two verses, they change the English translation. Continent. Just to make it sound better. Uh, but it's not consistent in translation. He's actually still talking about the Lord live up His face on you. 
I give you peace. Now you know <coughs> how important <coughs> it is to have the Lord's face looking at you, shining on you. Whichever man or woman on earth has God's face always looking at them, they will have the most powerful presence always in their life. And that is the position we as a church has come. When, what did Jesus pray for us? That they may be whole my glory. You see, glory is a subset of presence. Glory comes forth from the face of God. It's the face of God that radiates His glory. What about His angels? Alright. Let's look at uh, uh, his angels. There we go. What about his angels, you say? And, uh, well, let's uh, look at the book of Luke in the New Testament. Remember, it's a different language, but more or less they will. Luke chapter 1 verse 19. Here's Gabriel and he says, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. But the word presence is the word uh, inopion, which is a derivation of the word uh, uh, automa, automai, which means face. The end part is a prefix. See, N, E N, is like the word in. I'm standing in the presence of his face. That's what it means. But that's what the angels said that they are doing. Then, uh, when it comes to uh, believers, let's read um, some of the New Testament passages. Let's say, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.29. That no flesh should glory in His presence. Now look at the difference in presence. Uh, here it says, Anopian, okay? See the word anopian? It comes from two different uh, words. An and uh, opian. And let's look at. I'm going to bring you to the one. To the presence of Christ. Let's say. Ah, there it is. Was 1 Thessalonians 2 19. It says it was for. It was 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? It's not even you in the presence. Here is where you get the word uh, M prostan. Again, the word pros talk about right in the face. Pros is closer than in. Pros is right before. In the face of God. The presence of God. Prosopon is one of the uh, place where, okay, this is the different presence here. Let's look at another presence. Um, oh, yeah, then we'll go Revelations. And um, Let's talk about the presence of Lord from the Gospels to show you different Greek words that are used. Now, here is the presence of the angels. It says, it was 10. Luke chapter 15 was uh, 10. Likewise, I say to you, they joy in the presence and opion. So, the word presence is always related to the word face. 
interesting to say to you that. That uh, why is the word presence both in the Greek and in the Hebrew related to the word face? Apparently, everything has to do with the ability to see God's face. In the Old Testament time, God says no one can see him and be alive. He told Moses, no one can see him. If you see him, he will die. And that's why God keeps surrounding himself with his glory. Now you know what the glory is. He surrounds the glory because the glory is a step down of his presence. Even the glory is already powerful, but it's a many layer step down of his presence. The actual presence is his face. If you could see the face of God, that's it. Now, just to see when God shows his full face, in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, when God shows his full face right towards the white, great white throne judgment, it was 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face, what face? Prosopon. Prosopon. That means right in front of his eyes. It's the combination of two words. Optimize and pros. When they combine, it became prosopon. When right in front of his face, he says, when he showed his full face, the earth and the heaven run away. That is why you need the glory. The glory stepped down the presence of God. Now, this is our privilege. Look at chapter 22 of Revelation. Ultimately, this is where we are. Chapter 22. And it says in New Jerusalem, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. They shall see his face. And his name shall be on their foreheads. You will see God face to face. No being could do that before. No created being by New Jerusalem. Can you see the ultimate place? Where God wants us to be to see His face. Now, everything about from now to New Jerusalem is our growth in our ability to see God face to face. And it's up to you tonight, having heard this truth, to set yourself on the path to be won by the angels who stand in the presence of God. And what it means is, they can see God's face to different levels. To the angelic level that God allowed, they can see the face of God. And for us, there is no limit. We are the bride. The bride must see the bridegroom face to face. When he counsels the bride, isn't the most intimate, intimate sharing of two human relationships, the relationship of husband and wife. That's the most intimate. I mean, there is a sort of uh, relationship of fathers and children. There is some beauty to that. Mothers to children, there is. But the most intimate is when the two become one. That is why the bride can see the face 
of the bride. It is our destiny. Jesus himself prayed for it. And it's up to us to grow to the level where we can see. And you know where it starts now in the church age. I feel sad and sorry for every Christian who doesn't know that their destiny on earth is to train themselves to see God face to face. And they think that their destiny on earth is just to be earthly successful. By all means, be successful. All these things will be added to you. All the worldly things and the things of this earth will be added to you. Success is a given. But didn't the Bible say, when the Lord's face shines on you, you have the obed Edom effect. When the Lord's face is shining on you, you will be what the world calls, because the world doesn't know God, so the world will call you lucky. Blessed. They don't know the word blessed, so they use the word lucky. But it's not luck. Because the face of God is shining on you. It doesn't mean you don't have tribulations, persecutions. Because those are to train your character. To test whether you're dead to self. But it does mean that God's face is shining on you. And you are precious in God's sight. Very precious in God's sight. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all with unveiled face Beholding as in a mirror, actually mirroring the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, icon, same likeness, from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now that word is talking about glory. Then our key text tonight, key text tonight, to see the full way. Like, you know that, now you know that Panim is above uh, above Kabot. Kabot is glory. Panim is presence or face. It's always. It's above. It's a subset. The question tonight, how many levels lower? What is the different levels? So that we know how to go upwards to see the face of God. Now, don't jump. Because I know some, some people are always in a hurry. The moment you hear him, I say, I want to see the face of God. Instead, like Moses, you know, instead of saying, show me your glory. So tonight you say, show me your face. Show me your face. <laughs> and tomorrow we conduct a funeral service. Because <laughs> not ready yet. There are steps to it. The steps are found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. These are the steps. Firstly, it says that to those people who cannot see God or see His glory is because it was for their minds have been blinded by the God of this age, by the devil. So the devil is in the business of preventing you from seeing the glory of God. And we need to know that through prayer, that blindness can be removed. Once a person is blind, no point talking, no point arguing, no point reasoning, because 10,000 arguments were not convinced. Only God can take away the veil. Only God. And sometimes for some reason God allowed the veil to be there. Just as remember Isaiah, he says, you shall preach and they will not hear. Even Paul quoted that in the book of Acts chapter 28. When he was preaching to the Jews, they say, 
they got blindness there. Then he preached to the Gentiles, wow, they accepted. And he recognized because of the enemy that was working. So here he says, let's alight on the gospel and notice it's not just the gospel. It's the gospel of the glory of Christ. The gospel of the glory of Christ. He's talking about Christ's glory. And then, uh, who is the image of God should shine on them. Then come to verse 6, which is our key verse for tonight. In New Jerusalem, glory progressing. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. So it comes from God first. God has to send His light. And He has sent His light in Christ and through the preaching of the Word. That is why sometimes when you're under the right ministry, under the right preaching, suddenly your gifts operate. Suddenly you can see visions and downloads. Which is the same. Uh, one of the things that you'll find when you accept this ministry 100% without doubt, you will begin to have downloads. The moment you doubt 5%, 10%, 30% and allow it to cloud your mind, something stops. Because it is part and parcel of this ministry to bring you into the right resonance. When the right resonance flows, Things flow. And it's important to get into the right flow. Now, these are the different steps. It says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts. See, where the light is just shining is not in the mind, but the mind one is in Ephesians chapter 1. Here is talking about light in our heart. To give, and notice this, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the panim of Jesus Christ. Or face of Jesus Christ. Let's see the Greek word, prosopon. In his very sight. Although the Greek word emphasizes the word eyes in front of the face. I thought the face is to be seen. And notice four steps. Can you see four steps? The word knowledge is the common word gnosis. But there is also a play on some Greek words here. The word shine is from the Greek word uh, lampo which it means lamp. Table lamp. And uh, then the word light is from the word force. And force is like uh, uh, the source of the light shining. The result of the light shining is the other one, fortismos. Now, force and fortismos are what we call temporarily shining. That means like a torchlight that shines and then it's gone. But when I give you a lamp, you have it permanently. When I give you a lamp, it's like I give you a torchlight. Then anytime you can switch it on and off. Anytime you can use it. So what is happening here is it says, it is God who commanded light to produce a lamp in the darkness. Who has shown is the word lampo, who has put a lamp in your heart, a permanent lamp. And that lamp will give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See how many steps down from the word face? Four steps. Four steps. Glory is one step. But there are many steps. And for that, we have a little diagram. Okay, this diagram is really colorful. I got a new one. I know. 
This is the diagram. And we have from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You have the face. There is the face of God. Face of God. And of course, you cannot see God. You can only see God through the face of Christ. And to see Christ's face, you see the glory of Christ. And then remember, you give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Which means the next one is knowledge, which is the Greek word gnosis. Knowledge, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Then you have the light. The light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Wow! How many steps down? You have from God here, the original, not counting in. You have a here, I put the word in here. So, you have Christ's face. You have the glory of Christ. You have the knowledge of the glory of Christ. You have the light. And underneath that, before you come to the light, you have the voice. The voice will bring you to the light. My sheep hear my voice. Now you see the progression. Now, there are many levels of the glory. We assume this level 2 has many multiple, multiple levels. And up to the glory of the Lamb. Which is New Jerusalem glory. Right. Then we look at the chart now. We realize we have a progression to make. I, in the progression as you make, I bring you back to the answer to question two. Why did Paul, when he wrote the book of Hebrews, mention that we are waiting, Christ is waiting to get everything put at his feet? After he mentioned all things are put at his feet, he immediately talked about the glory, glorification of the church. Look at it very carefully. It's all connected. So the more glory we have, the more things are put under the feet. Ah, now. So very quickly, I just point to those verses. Hebrews chapter... Two. Hebrews chapter 2 and it says here he left nothing that is not put under him it was said nothing everything so is put under him but now we do not yet see all things put under him but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste that for everyone. So death already destroyed in him. He tasted it for everyone. Then verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom, for whom are all things? By whom are all things? He's talking about the same subject. Of Christ bringing everything under his feet. In bringing many sons to glory. When he brings his sons into glory, 
the work is done. Everything is under his feet. See the connection that is there. Now look at the connection also in Romans chapter 8. It is there, plain in your plain eyesight. You cannot run from that. That is all connected. And it says, Paul says, We are heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Obviously, we are supposed to be like Him. That we may be glorified together. Verse 18, Romans 8. For consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation, the creation, creation is everything that is in this harmony, including humans who live on earth, empires that are based on this earth, because no empire can be built without resources from the earth, without harvesting things from the earth. Without organizing things that are dependent on the earth. No army can survive without food. No army can survive without money. Everything are resources from the earth. All creation. It says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. It's like when the sons of God are revealed, creation is happy. Everything is complete. Everything is under the feet of Jesus. Everything ties together. But here's the thing. When you look at this picture, I'll switch to and fro. When you look at this picture, here's the thing. Do you notice there's a knowledge of the glory? And it's a simple word here, gnosis. Unknowing. And this knowledge that is in number two, uh, which is number three here, looking backwards, is dependent on your faith, your belief. The moment you doubt, your downloads will stop. The moment you disassociate yourself from this ministry, which is a voice that cry at midnight, you are no longer part of the movement. You might come back later in the future, but this is the move. We are not the only one with the message, but there is only one red Indian chief. Because the main chief is our Lord Jesus Christ. There are no two voices, no two opposing voices. When you have a group of people together, even though we practice democracy, you have to still have a chairman. You always still must have a moderator. You always must have. Don't you all, can, a lot of modern countries are run on a democratic system? but they still have head of government. They still have either a prime minister or president. Because in the end, you have to have one person with executive power in order to bring everything together. Because when you have 1,000 people, you have 1,000 heads thinking 1,000 different directions. And people need to be persuaded convince, reason to accept one line or argument. And whoever the moderator coordinator is, that person must have the ability to bring 1,000 arguments into a logical conclusion of one direction. Now you understand the calling. It's important that because we are in a democratic society, we are not in a dictatorship. Although we are in a monarchy, living in a time of the ten toes, which is a democratic time. In a democracy, the powers of persuasion are important. Do you know what the Antichrist will also use? Powers of persuasion. The Antichrist will have the gift of the gap. 
but he will be of the devil. What we reason from the word of God and from Christ. In the end, knowledge, this knowledge is important. Now let me shift to and fro and show why. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, which talks about New Jerusalem and New Jerusalem glory. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, uh, verse, 18. Oh, verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. And then he thought about yet once more he will shake. But what's the conclusion in in this place? This is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. When you look to previous verses and all that is the conversation that has gone before, he's talking about looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Can you see the word faith there? This follows from chapter 11, which is the chapter of faith. Chapter 12 begins with, Therefore, which means it was dependent on chapter 11. After talking about faith and what faith is, if you look at chapter 11, you know what faith is? Although in verse 1 it says faith is the substance of things, so for the evidence of things not seen. And then we got our own definition of faith uh, from the heavenly perspective, where we talk about how faith you know, is actually the substance of God, uh, framed by the word of God to create things spiritual and natural. But you look at chapter 11 very carefully. Every one of the men and women of faith had one thing in common. They heard God's voice. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the voice of God. It was not just a written word. Then I show you, it's not just a written word. It was a spoken word. Look at chapter 11. Does any one of them here in chapter 11, when they exercise their faith, see, by faith, by faith, by faith, can you see all the by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, and all these uh, live by faith, okay, from way after there, from by faith Noah. All this by faith, by faith, by faith, is not the faith that comes by the written word. Although the written word is important. Remember, the written word, which is here, contains what was once upon a time the spoken word to the people who were alive. Correct? When did Abraham have a Bible? He had no Bible. When did Moses have a Bible? He had no Bible. And then you read about some people with a lot of Bible, like Ezra. Do you hear them hearing God's voice a lot? No. But they became good people. They are like the scribes. Ezra. But every time you got signs and wonders and miracles and great astonishing things they have done, it's not because they are people of the written word. It's because they are people of the spoken word. Did Elijah have the written word? Yes. Moses' writing was already available. But 
Was it the spoken word or the written word that produced all these miracles? You can answer both. His background was a written word. It's because he saw in the word that if the people sin against God, the heavens will turn its brass, correct? But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter, uh, in, in James chapter 5, he prayed until there was no rain. That was spoken word. And then God said, there will be no rain. And then in 1 Kings 17, he says, there will be no rain until I say so. Tell me where's the Bible for that? The Bible only say that this is going to happen. But the Bible never say this is going to happen only when Elijah says so. Okay, that's a different thing. It looks like misapplication of the written word. But no! He prayed through and the Lord says, Elijah, you pray to stop the rain, I stop it. But you are the one who has to start it. That's why he can go out and say, Ephesians, uh, in James chapter 5 said, he was the one who stopped the rain. He actually asked God to stop the rain. James 5. He prayed for the rain to stop. And when the rain stopped, he went to Ahab and said, there will be no rain except at my word. Those are the exact words. Except at my word. Then he walked off. Everyone laughed. Everyone didn't believe. But, they never saw rain. And then they looked high and low for him. Even the brook dried up. And it, it began to rain only when he built an altar. And he prayed. He called fire to come down. And then it began. The Baal, false Baal prophets were slaughtered. Then it rained. He prayed for the rain. He stopped the rain. And everyone in this book, they heard God's voice. They had the written word. Some of them don't. Noah didn't. Noah heard God's voice. Think how silly it was. Why build a big boat on land? No one says, there's going to be rain and flood. Everybody said, we don't even know what is rain. For it had not rained. Nobody know what rain was like. He might have to describe what rain is. Nobody believed. He believed. Crazy, isn't it? But these are the last days. By faith, Abraham obeyed God. Was it written word, spoken word? It's spoken word. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise. Written word, spoken word, spoken word. Of course, at that time, he didn't have any written word. Sarah, again. Spoken word and, uh, and we go further. Abraham again, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, uh, Moses uh, several times, and then we become the Joshua. Joshua already got written word, but it says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Tell me where in the written word can Joshua find out that he must walk around the Jericho once every day for uh, six days or the seven day seven times? Where, where in the Bible? He had the he had the Bible five books. He had to hear the voice. He had to hear the spoken word. The spoken word tell him what to do. Because the written word doesn't tell him what to do. The written word laid down the principles. It laid down the general direction. It laid down the areas not to go into. But it does not tell him specifically what to do. He need 
the spoken word. If our God is a God who is alive, if our God and our Jesus and Jesus is alive, risen from the dead, then He still speaks. If He still speaks, where are the people who can hear Him today? And if we can hear Him, where are those who are obeying Him today? There has to be people who still can hear God. Otherwise, it is finished. There's no hope. But there is hope. And there is faith. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the spoken word of God. The rima of God. Then you have all these other people. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel. All these. They got the written word. But it was a spoken word. That they rely on. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice and they know me. That's what our Lord Jesus said. And all this. So all this spoken word, spoken word, spoken word, and all this spoken word, which comes to this little thing here that I mentioned in the diagram. Can you see here why number three, knowledge comes from faith and the Nazi system. Knowledge is a system of belief and principles. It's not just a knowledge, it's knowledge of the glory of Christ. It is dependent on faith. And faith is dependent on the word. Both the written word and the spoken word. We need the written word to enter into the rest. Because, you know why you need the written word? The written word actually prepares you to hear the spoken word. The written word is mentioned in Hebrews 4 verse 12. And the Logos of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. It's living and powerful. And it divides between soul and spirit. And Hebrews 4 verse 12 is talking about Hebrews 4 verse 10, which is how to enter the rest. You cannot hear God unless you're at rest. You cannot hear God unless you know what is come from your soul or what comes from your spirit. Isn't what many people's problem is, is that they think that some things that are being heard is from the soul or from the flesh and not from God. So how do we know? The written word cuts and puts us into the position to really hear the spoken word. The spoken word of God. And that is why Hebrews 11 was important to Hebrews 12. And Hebrews 12, when you're established in hearing the spoken word, you are ready to enter into New Jerusalem. You have come to Mount Zion. The same way we see here, knowledge, the light, the voice, leads you to the light, leads you to the knowledge of the glory of Christ. This area. One more scripture. When you look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And it points to this same chart. Although we, this chart is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Same chap 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Do you notice there in verse 18? But we all with unveiled face. Now what happened if you read this scripture and you didn't fulfill this part? That means, but we all with veiled faces are not able to behold or mirror the glory of the Lord. Thus we cannot be transformed into the same image from glory to glory. All the whole thing is based on this unveiled face. Correct? <coughs> if it is a veiled face, everything else that comes after that is cancelled. So what is an unveiled face? We are not talking about physical faces here. 
Because the context tells you the veil is in the heart. Can you see that? Verse 15. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. It's the heart. Remember what the Lord says about good ground? The seed fall on four types of ground. The first ground cannot even stand the attack of the devil. Doubts. Second ground is cannot stand persecution or hardship. Third ground cannot stand distraction. And it all has to do with the condition of the heart. So what type of ground we are will determine whether you can be transformed into a new Jerusalem glory properly. It has to do with the heart. The question is, what type of heart do you have? An unbelieving heart? A doubting heart? Or a weak heart that cannot stand persecution? Or a worldly heart that is easily distracted. Or a good heart where the word can take root and grow. The veil is in the heart. It's important to choose to have a good heart. Alright. That is why it ties back to this chapter, knowledge, faith, belief is in the heart, in the heart. Didn't our uh, Lord Jesus say, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see. So somehow the word, the manifest presence of God, Jesus approached it from different angles. He said, if you love me, love my word. And he says, my word has made you clean. Again, uh, anything to do with the word has to do with, here, knowledge. The word gives the correct knowledge. And as it produces the right knowledge in you, now you know why, even before you can see the glory, you must get into the correct Gnosis. So you have here from Phone, oh, I start writing in Greek. Phone, uh, uh, from voice, from Phone to Phos to Gnosis. To doxa, to the face of Christ, prosopon. From the face of Christ, there is a progression. Tonight, as we enter into prayer, and I reverse it in order. Okay. Let's approach from our side. And uh, what is that? Okay, I've done something there. Oh, okay, so. Ah, okay. And uh, so let's put it this way step one. Step two, step three, step four. As presented by Second Corinthians four. But there is a precursor, step zero. We must hear the voice or hear the word of God. Respond to the gospel. Come to Jesus. So let's assume we are here. There are people out in the world who haven't even come here. So they cannot even be part of these steps and transformation. 
Remember 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, part of these steps are here. It says, as we mirror him, so are we transformed into the same image. You cannot start mirroring until you do. Because 2 Corinthians 3, 18, it all has to do with the glory. It uses the word glory twice in verse 18. It has to do with stage 3. So this stage 3 is not successful. You don't have this area where your heart and the things in your mind. Now, I forgot to point to one more, one more section. In, uh, when we are looking at 2 Corinthians 3, when it says that the will lies in your heart, I want you to see that it's also in the mind. That in verse uh, 14. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Because the veil is taken in Christ. And the word mind is the word pneuma, which is a, a product of their Gnosis. Uh, so apparently, there's a blindness in the mind. Now, if I, oops, I don't go too far. And then you see the blindness that is there, where the gospel is weighed, a veil to those in verse 3, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds, again, Numa, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Then, having looked at that, remember this St. Corinthians, St. Corinthians. St. Corinthians has quite a lot of different things that actually link up, but we never link up. I'll link up for you right now. And, uh, in St. Corinthians, here, uh, in chapter 4, uh, chapter 10, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, gnosis of God. The same Gnosis you're talking about. Everything that exhausts itself against the Gnosis of God. Same Gnosis. Which means that the mind is also involved. And uh, in comes to this place here. Besides the faith, belief, heart, and belief system is affected by our mind and the choices that our mind makes. So can you see the blockage that we need to go through? And that's why the Lord says, unless you become like a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. And then He blessed the children and said, you know, uh, you know blessed are ye for they are like the little children because to such God has perfected praise and God has revealed many things. You want revelation? It has to come from being childlike. Didn't say childish. Childlike. Childlike. So the heart has to become back to the place where it's pliable before God. And at that stage, then... We want, to, we want to, the presence of God and the face of God are equal. Now we can see. Now, we are all supposed to be able to see God face to face through Christ. This is where God wants us to be. This is where most of us are. We are struggling to even hear God's voice, be led by the Spirit. To be sensitive to an inward witness, inward voice. Red light, green light inside. We're all struggling here. And there are various people, you know. And, and uh, the funny thing about Christianity is that some things can be right for a person and wrong for the, another person. Like Romans chapter 14 and uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Like idol, eating idol food. Paul says, you know, you know uh, to those who are weak, you know, uh, they should not. Uh, the stronger makes no difference. And uh, eating vegetables or not eating vegetables, or eating meat or mix, or keeping one day or keeping every day to, as a day to the Lord, Romans 14. It says, you know, those who are weak, you know, they will be more 
in that limited religiosity. But to those who are strong, every day is a day unto the Lord. And then Paul basically says in Romans 14, everything, you can eat everything. But it says to those who are weak, you know, the only things that uh, vegetarian is the only spiritual thing. It doesn't have to do with spirituality. It has to do with health reasons. Then that's fine. But when you become something spiritual, religious, then that's a way out. Uh, so, most of us are here. We are only seeing some light force. Remember, there is a land that God has placed in your heart when you are born again. So this light is the light of the knowledge. That means if the knowledge is correct, it will produce a light. It's the light of the knowledge. Look at how many steps it is. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In the end, it's the face of Christ. But you, you don't actually see the face of Christ. He has asked how many of you have seen Jesus face face at all. So you say, okay, and now I have not seen Jesus. But Jesus' face is really shining on your inside. Beyond the clouds. And it's beyond feeling. You know some things you can see but cannot touch and feel yet. For example, in the natural clouds. You can see the clouds. But if you're out on a high mountain, the clouds come by. You cannot actually hold a cloud. Somebody might look from down the down the mountain looking at you and say, Hey, you are in the clouds! Reach out and grab some for me. You cannot. But yet you can see. Your heart can see. But you might not be able to touch it and feel it yet. And so it's important that when the knowledge is correct, the light begins to lead you in the right direction. The light of the knowledge, and this is the two things God is working on. When you have the correct knowledge, like yesterday I talked about the history of creation. You know, when many of us see, when God said, let there be light, you wonder what it was. Now you know the let there be light was the one-third universe. It was not the whole universe. The whole universe was already created in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. But it was for that section. And when you, when you see the truth, other things come in. One aspect of truth will bring many other downloads on that level of truth. It clears the way. It's just like uh, uh, for a long time, humans have, have believed that the, the sun goes around the earth. And it prevents a lot of discoveries. Prevented, because their myths were based on that. And the calculation was very difficult. It's very hard to construct how things move. If trying to construct something mechanical based on the principle that the stars, the moon, and the sun go round the earth and the earth is a center. It's very hard because something that is accurate to the natural. It's very hard because the movement really had to be a very complicated movement. It's like touching the ear this way. When you put the other way around, everything goes around the sun. Then, ah, it's easy. Easy to relate. Because anything that is truth is simple, clear, concise, and it lets the light in. When something is not the truth, it will complicate things so that we have to find very... You know, long ways to try to explain something that is not actually the explanation. And long ago, when they believed the earth was flat, it was very hard to explain a lot of things. And their deception also paralyzed and put them in bondage. 
If the truth sets us free, then the untruth puts us into bondage. In the jungles, today, there are tribes that might not have the gospel reached to them, and they might believe that there's a spirit behind every tree. Because of their belief system, it might prevent them from doing things in agriculture, or harvesting the trees, or making use of the wood of the trees for building, because of their belief system. So a belief system can paralyze us if it's wrong. When it's correct, it will produce life. So if the correct knowledge produces light, the incorrect knowledge produces darkness. Can you see that? So studying the word, knowing the word, and knowing the truth, it has taken a long time for us to know truth in many, many areas. And as we learn more of this truth, the light grows stronger, and then we grow into this. And this light of the knowledge will create the knowledge of the glory of Christ. And it's inside this glory that you will live in and dwell in. And you should dwell in it for some time. And you'll get adjusted to level 3. Your heart, your mind, your spiritual ears and sensitivity get adjusted to this glory. It's just like getting adjusted to the higher level and you begin to see the, a glimpse of the face of Christ. Once you begin to see a glimpse of the face of Christ, you will through Christ see the face of God. And as you get more and more in this area, as you start living more and more in this area, and allow the image of God to be inside you. As it gets inside you, there's a resonance. As a resonance that we see more and more and more of the face of God. At some point in this revival, when you reach the glory of New Jerusalem and the Lamb of God, you begin to see more because New Jerusalem is the fullness of the face of the Lamb and of the Father. And we are supposed to get that blessing in this church age. It's one of the blessings in the seven churches where the name of New Jerusalem is written on your forehead. And it means that you begin to see this level on the face of God and something in you begins to change. And here's the interesting puzzle. When Lord was running out from Sodom and Gomorrah with his wife and his two daughters. Later they produced uh, Ammon and Moab. Lot's wife looked back, correct? When she looked back, the Bible says she was turned into a pillar of salt. Somehow, what she saw radiate into her and she herself was destroyed. Something happened in a powerful way that whatever she saw, she became. And they were told by the angel, do not look. So I'm assuming that it was not just natural. But something spiritual was going on that they must not see. I remember the animals of Jacob when he was peeling the poplar trees and all that. And whenever the animals were mating, he put it before them. And as the animals see the white and the speckle and the spot and the strips that are there, the animals started producing and speckle. Animals don't know how to visualize. Animals don't know how to analyze principles. But when it enters the image of the animals, 
it changed the DNA of the product. Didn't Jacob take two clean white sheep, for example, and he went for the strong one? Because remember, when he started doing that, he had zero spotted speckled sheep or animal. All of the spotted, speckled ones and, and striped ones had been taken away by Laban. Laban was a cheat. He promised Jacob. Jacob said, give me all the spotted, speckled ones. And he says, alright, fine. And then secretly he took all of them out. And then when Jacob looked up, huh, none. They were there the day before. But after he agreed with Laban, he went out and said, there were none. There were zero sheep or cattle or animal that was spotted and speckled. And he literally changed the DNA. When the animals were mating, he put it right in front of their eyes. And somehow, their DNA changed so that they started producing spotted and speckled. And he's very clever. When the strong animal come, he put. Then the skinny one, weak one, half dead one say, <laughs> So you know, end up all the the strong ones were spotted, speckled, and striped. All the weak ones were all plain colours. So he got the stronger and stronger one and Laban got the weaker, weaker one. What wow, these two cheat, cheat each other? <laughs> really, something wrong somewhere. Though. Um, the fact here is, animals don't know how to read Bible, but just their vision. So God can begin to cause you to see the light first. I know when you all start visualizing, because if you all start where I started, the first thing you can see is actually you can visualize some light. Understandable force that is there. Okay. So you can see some light that is there. But that light depends on the knowledge. The more your knowledge is clean, the more you be your belief system is in the right order, and your understanding is correct, exactly reflecting the truth that is out there, and that is in the spiritual world, that light increases. As it increases, the glory increases. Isn't it true that every time where the glory of God is revealed, it was always based on previous revelation? The glory of God was revealed in chapter 40 of Exodus at the end of the obedience to the spoken word. The glory of God was revealed to the people in the temple of Solomon at the end of seven years of building the temple and in the day of dedication in St. Chronicles chapter, chapter 5 the glory of God appeared when they were worshipping God then it appeared again the second time when Solomon had finished his prayer of dedication chapter 6 2 Chronicles and second time another wave of glory is always at the end of obedience to faith. Faith is obedient to the spoken word. And the heart must be the right heart all the time. With all this in the background that allows the knowledge and the Nazis to form, the knowledge of God that God says, let every thought that is against the knowledge of God be removed, and only the thought that is a knowledge of God remain. And then that light is strong. And then we enter into this glory and you live in this glory for some time. You see different levels of glory. And you live in this different level of glory. From time to time you see the face of Christ. See the face of Christ. Because there is a part, part of tuning. Let me describe some things in heaven. Heaven, you might think that even though we are privileged to be seated in the right hand, uh, uh, the right hand of God, seated in Christ, when you actually spiritually go to heaven with your uh, consciousness, you find there's a protocol. 
there's a preparation before you enter into different places. And there are places in heaven that you cannot enter without invitation. God has a command. Just as, remember it says, God commanded the light to shine. If God didn't command, the light wouldn't shine. So there are places in heaven that you cannot go unless God says, come. So you need God. And that means that you actually spend a time waiting and worshipping. And you wait and worship. You wait and worship. You wait and worship. You wait and worship. Then God said, come. And then you go. And you spend some time there. Then when you finish, God says, alright, go your way now. And you go. And then you wait and worship. You wait and worship. You wait and worship. Then God said, come. And come. Didn't John heard the word come? It says, come up. Didn't Kenneth E. Hagin heard the word? Come. Come up here. Remember that? His book, I believe in vision. God has actually command. But you must be in this place to hear that command. In this place, sorry, you still got to learn to hear his voice. And this voice will lead you to the burning bush, to where you need to wait on God. But leading up here, when God says come, that you come. The good thing is, once He allow you in a place once, the access becomes easier the second time. And the third time. Then there are more places in God to explore. You again go to wait. And then God says, come. And then you can go. Permission has to be granted. Because the face of God has so many dimensions. And that relates to the next time that we teach to the four faces. Why it takes four to reflect the face of God and the face of the Lamb. But for today, we prepare ourselves. Remember when we dim the lights and all those things, your eyes can continue to see spiritually with the right heart, right condition. Uh, in every all night, you should actually be in dialogue with God. God speaks to you, you speak to God. And not necessarily that you hear a lot of things. Sometimes at the end, you're just waiting, worshipping, waiting, worshipping. But you just have one word, one sentence, a few things from God. That's good enough. Things that God has to speak to you. We all must hear God's voice. And as we flow into God and just enjoy His presence, a lot of things are going to take place. And I consider all night prayer as a time to travel into the dimension of heaven. Where you can sit and your body could be sitting and praying, but you could be exploring a lot of dimensions in the spirit. So let's go to God in prayer. Prepare ourselves. Thank you. Let's sing a simple song and then we go to prayer. In the morning, uh, because we don't have that many all night prayers that are teaching, uh, we especially for the few that remains, we want to have communion in the ending. And, uh, so uh, you can prepare the communion early. And then we will leave it here to soak in the whole night's prayer. And, uh, and then if you leave early, uh, you can take, uh, take one early and take one for Shalom. Yeah. Okay. So um, we will prepare that. Uh, so let's worship God and prepare our hearts before Him.